although, you know, we talk about all these huge things, the television money and the this money and the that money, it's actually, it's all the same people who are paying the money. It's football fans. So the money comes from people who love the game. And that is a relationship. In fact, it's like a family relationship. Now, in China, it isn't really family, except perhaps for a very small but growing group of people where it's becoming that kind of relationship. Like football clubs all over the world, the Chinese Sea League teams depend on their fans to remain viable. A large fan base means greater ticket sales, more sponsors and lucrative television broadcast revenues. However, the Chinese clubs have not been able to attract this sort of following yet, and it's not unusual to find most stadium seats unoccupied on game days. At this particular match, for instance, the crowd control personnel were in serious danger of outnumbering the crowd. For the Chinese, growing the business is about growing the fan base. But sometimes you get the impression that they think they can miss that bit out. You know, that we can just get on with flogging, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, the shirts and everything else. And it's not the case. Attracting a large fan base is not a problem, however, when the Chinese national team is playing. And when China took the field against Qatar in the third of its qualifiers, half a billion Chinese watched the game live on television. There was a lot to play for. It was tiny Qatar who had humiliated China in the previous World Cup campaign. But the Chinese team was different this time. They had a Serbian coach, Bora Milutinovic, and he had taken four other nations to the World Cup finals. And there were five members of the squad who had had international experience playing with clubs overseas. This time, China expected to win, and so were totally unprepared for what happened next. For most of the match, it seemed that once again, they would be humbled by a nation whose entire population was only 800,000. And then, a minute before full time, Li Wei Feng came to the rescue. The whole process of selecting players in China is perverse in a number of ways. As one Shanghainese lad said to me, if we had one player for every 100 million of us, we'd have a squad. <laughs> I said, it's not a numbers game, unfortunately. Holland, nine million people, five class acts, every generation. So you see, it's not about numbers. It's about culture and it's about coaching. In the last 10 years, we think that the Chinese 那么使人们能够从青少年开始培养足球意识,增强足球理论和观念。Central to the CFA's 10-year youth policy was the revolutionary decision to stimulate the creation of thousands of football schools throughout the country. The showpiece of this scheme is the Shanghai Shenhua Football School near Pudong. It has 300 full-time students from both primary and secondary age groups. Their mornings are spent at conventional studies, but in the afternoon, it's all football. The annual fees for this school are 20,000 yuan, and for this, the students receive all their training, their clothing, food and accommodation. But with the average wage for most Chinese somewhere between two and five thousand yuan per year, it's an expense few can afford. 
大概二三十年了，但是都都在继承，啊，业余的多，啊啊，那当然，首先一个要选材了，啊，还有由于特殊的有有种原因吧，现在你看这个学校，啊，要要收费用的，那就是，那这个你。不一定翻给他听嘛，然后就是有钱的，他技术不行的也能进来，但是踢得好的，他没钱就没办法进。This is a lot of money to pay to a private school for your son in a one-parent family system, pretty much. So an awful lot of attention focused on single children of the middle class. And that means that instead of selecting your 11 from a third of the world, actually you're selecting from a little bunch of bourgeois boys whose parents could afford to send them to football academies where they eventually come to the attention of the professional game, you hope. Now, we don't run our football academies like that. <laughs> Joe's got to push across, Morgan comes central, Jack makes the dog leg. And the same on the other side, if Morgan gets pushed across, they train one night a week, which is all their technical work, and then their match play is, is on the Saturday, either with, against boys of their own age or of older boys, because that's good for morale. Uh, it shows the character in the boys as well. Now, can we play quickly again, boys? Adam, James, 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 move it. The football is in everybody's blood, and the, the, the parents promoting the children as an interest, not realizing that they're going to make a lot of money. Adam's nice and strong, he never so well. Seven years old, he's been playing since he was about, he's been kicking the ball since he was about three. So he just lives for football, basically. He's been with about another three or four other clubs and now he's just decided to come to Sheffield United. Jaws and Jaws. Yeah, he's going to check him out. No. Good luck! You know, in China, the population, how much? 1.3 billion? I'm sure that if everybody trained like this here, we've got, we have been in the World Cup probably five years ago. Three rounds into their qualifying matches for the World Cup, and China were sitting comfortably on top of their group. And whilst the team was performing well as a whole, several players were emerging as major contributors. Central defender Li Wei Feng's ambition to play abroad could not have had a more perfect preparation. His dashing runs and explosive scoring brought the crowd to its feet and attracted the attention of both the domestic and international media. And even though Fan Ji Yi had signed with Dundee and was travelling back and forth to the UK, his commitment to the young team was just as strong and paying real dividends.